Hello and welcome to our video summarising all you need to know about the Songs of Ourselves Volume 1 Part 3 Anthology. My name is Barbara and in this video I'll summarise each poem, beginning with a little context about the poet before analysing the poem in depth. Do make sure you have your anthology handy before you listen to each analysis and read the poem first. In this way you'll get a better grasp of the poem's meaning. So let's get started. Now this collection begins with Caged Bird by Maya Angelou. Now, this poem is arguably one of the most moving and eye-opening poems ever written. She also wrote an autobiography with this same title, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, and it's clear that this title had a great significance to Maya Angelou, as it was the title to her entire life story. In her autobiography, she talked about the struggle of being a black author, in other words an African American, as well as a poet. She often felt that her words were not heard because of the colour of her skin. She felt that, in some ways, she was still experiencing slavery, even if slavery had been outlawed during her time. Although African American people were free, there were still many restrictions that were placed upon them in Jim Crow era USA, making it so that many African Americans didn't feel free at all. Now when it comes to the poem itself, when, with regards to the first stanza, Maya Angelou begins by referring to nature. She describes the way, as the poem states, a free bird leaps on the back of the wind. She describes a bird's flight against the orange sky, and a free bird has the right to claim the sky. The way she describes the orange sun rays gives the reader an appreciation of the natural beauty of the sky, and her description of the way the bird dips his wing helps the reader appreciate the bird in its natural habitat as it's enjoying its freedom. However, the second stanza is a stark contrast to the first. The stanza begins with the word, but, to begin, and it prepares the reader for this contrast. Angelou then describes the bird that stalks his narrow cage. This quote puts a really dark tone and it shifts drastically from the peaceful, satisfied and joyful tone of the first stanza to one that's dark, unnerving and even frustrating. She says that this caged bird first can seldom see through the bars of rage. While the free bird gets to enjoy the full sky, the caged bird rarely gets even a glimpse of it. The text from Maya Angelou's autobiography also reveals that she herself felt this way in life. She felt very restricted from enjoying the freedom she could have had as a human being. In the poem, the speaker then reveals that these are the very reasons that the bird opens his throat to sing. The author felt this same way in her own life. Angelou wrote and sang and danced because this was her only way of expressing her longing for freedom. In the third stanza, this reverts back to the free bird, further cementing the difference between the free bird and the caged bird. Angelou writes that a free bird thinks of another breeze and he can enjoy sighting trees and is free to find his own food. The tone which she writes the first and th third stanzas really sharply contrasts with the second stanza, and the reader can really see the stark difference. When we shift into the fourth stanza, this continues again the parallel between the life experienced by the free bird versus the difficult life experienced by the caged bird. The first line of the fourth stanza serves to starkly contrast the last line in the third stanza. It's really dark, daunting, and also to some extent haunting. The reality of the life of the caged bird is revealed here. The poem states, the bird stands on the grave of dreams. This metaphor reveals Angelou's feelings about her own dreams. She had so many dreams that died because she was really never given the freedom in a racist country that all her white counterparts were able to achieve. The discrimination and racism that she experienced within America made up her cage and although Angelou sang, she felt her voice was not heard in the wider world. The second line of this stanza is not only dark but also frightening, as the speaker describes the bird's cries as shouts on a nightmare scream. At this point, the caged bird is so despondent about his life of captivity that he screams like someone having a nightmare. Now when you shift into the fifth stanza, this final stanza focuses on the caged bird yet again. The author, Angelou, implies that even though the caged bird may have never experienced true freedom, deep down they still know that they were created to be free. Although freedom to the caged bird is fearful because it's an unknown, 
the bird still sings a fearful trill, which is an oxymoron. This is because it shows the bird's longing for freedom. This parallels to Maya Angelou and her cry for freedom in the form of, of equality. And of course, Maya Angelou was one of the important figures during the civil rights movement within the US that advocated for equal rights amongst African Americans and for them to enjoy the same rights as white Americans. Angelou feels her cries are heard within this poem, but only as soft background noise. She still feels that she's caged, and although she sings, her cries are only heard as a distant noise. And the last line of the stanza states, For the caged bird sings of freedom. With this, the speaker implies that although the caged bird men have never experienced freedom, they still are able to sing about it because this bird was created for freedom. This, of course, parallels the African-American struggle during Maya Angelou's time. She felt that a lot of African-Americans wrote and sang and danced and cried out for the freedom that they deserved, but they're only heard as a distant voice. However, this would not stop them from crying out for freedom and equality because they knew they were made for freedom and they would not relent until they were given their rights. And of course, they successfully did attain their rights in 1964 under the Freedom Rights Act. Now, the next collection's poem in this collection is Sonnet 43 by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Now, Elizabeth Barrett Browning is a renowned Victorian poet who has managed to achieve a lot of acclaim in her lifetime. She influenced several British and American poets, particularly Emily Dickinson. A prolific writer, Elizabeth Bar Barrett Browning's poems came to the attention of another famous poet at the time, Robert Browning. The two eventually married, but were forced to wed secretly because of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's father. He found out about the nuptials and disinherited his daughter, who was going to eventually be wealthy, had she inherited from her father. Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Robert Browning moved to Italy, and they were both encouraged each other with their writings. Elizabeth Barrett Browning ultimately died in Italy at the age of 55. Now, this poem, Sonnet 43, is easily one of the most famous and recognisable poems. In this poem, the speaker essentially is proclaiming her unending passion for her beloved, and in many ways, it echoes Barrett Browning's own love for Robert Browning to the extent that she gave up everything, including her inheritance for him. In the poem, the speaker states that she loves this person with all of her being, and she hopes God will grant her the ability to love him even after she's passed away. Now, as was mentioned, Barrett Browning fell in love with Robert Browning after he reached out to her about their writing. They wrote back and forth initially before finally marrying. However, their marriage was one that was totally forbidden by her father. And of course, this poem is a reflection of this. Now, firstly, in terms of the structure of this poem, or rather its form, it's classified as a sonnet. In other words, it's a love poem. And this is because it contains 14 lines of poetry and it has a fixed rhyme scheme of A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, C, D, C, D. One can assume that Barrett Browning is also the speaker of the poem since it's well known just how deeply she and Robert Browning loved and cared for each other. Based on the initial line of this poem, it seems that the speaker has asked a question prior to reciting the poem. The first line also serves as a motivation for the rest of the work. It begins, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Elizabeth Barrett Browning then uses the last 13 lines of the poem to show just how much she loves her husband. Lines two to four of the poem provide the first way in which the speaker loves her husband. The poem states, I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace. Here we find that Browning is describing her love as deep, wide and tall as it possibly can be. And it's so vast that she cannot even see the edges of it. It's infinite. In the next two lines, Barrett Browning continues to show her husband how much she loves him. She writes, I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. And these lines are particularly beautiful in their simplicity. While her love knows no bounds, the speaker also loves her beloved in ordinary, everyday life. She needs him as much as she needs her other basic necessities of life. In line 7 and 8, Barrett Browning writes of two other ways she loves this person. She writes, I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. These lines give an innate sense of feeling to her love. Just as men naturally strive to do what is good and right, Barrett Browning freely loves. 
In addition, she loves Robert Browning purely, just as men turn from praise in order to maintain their humility. The speaker, indeed, doesn't want thanks or attention for her love, just like these good men. She loves because that's what she was created to do, that's what she wants to do. Barrett Browning continues this pattern of showing how much she loves her husband by writing, I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. And the diction here is really interesting because she's taking the feelings she has about something relatively negative and comparing it to the feelings she has for her husband. Old griefs can be defined as anything that a person passionately despises. Therefore here she's telling her husband that she has as much passion for him as she does for the things in life that she just can't stand. She also loves him with the faith of a child, which is very innocent. Children's faith is usually very steadfast and true. And just like a child has faith, so too does the speaker have love for their husband. Barrett Browning continues with a religious motif in the next lines when she writes, I love thee with the love I seemed to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles and tears of all my life. And her reference to lost saints is a reference to all those people she once loved and adored in her life. The love she once felt for them and that she has eventually lost has now been transferred into the love she feels for her husband. And additionally, she loves him with all that she is, her breath, her smiles, her tears. And Barrett Browning confesses that she loves her husband with all that has made up her life. The poem ends by acknowledging that she will continue to love her husband forever if God allows her to do so. Not only will she love him well into eternity, she writes, but she'll also love him better than she does so presently and her love will only continue to grow. Now the next poem in this collection is Farmhand by James K. Baxter. Now this poem is a five stanza poem divided into sets of four lines which are quatrains and these quatrains vary in a number of different ways but they are unified through one important element. They're unique from one another in the line lengths, the pattern of metre, the syllable numbers and word choice. However, the poet has chosen to unify them through punctuation. So each stanza is made up of one long phrase that ends with a period or a full stop in the fourth line. This punctuation choice means that each stanza is itself a separate thought or scene and the first set of lines show the main character from one angle, then the second from his own perspective and so on until the reader reaches the end of the narrative. Now, this poem describes a lack of confidence that a farmhand, somebody who works on a farm, has regarding his appearance and relationship prospects. The poem starts with a speaker describing an interesting man who's both social and contemplative. He can often be found watching the dance floor of a music hall and observing all the beautiful comings and goings. It becomes clear, however, that he never does more than just observe. He doesn't see himself as deserving or being suited to the life of a lover. The farmhand, who appears to be down on his life and appearance, is able to take some comfort in the fact that he can still hope something good will happen to him. In the final lines, the speaker asks the reader not to judge the man based on how he looks, or what he thinks he doesn't have, but on what he displays during the harvest season. This man is uncommonly strong and hardworking, and he also has a gentle side that he takes advantage of to care for his machinery. Now, in stanza one, the speaker, who's really not the main character of the poem, introduces the reader to the farmhand. The poet has made the decision to thrust the reader into this narrative right from the middle of, in the middle of the action, in other words, a media ray. The farmhand is experiencing a moment and a set of emotions which are common in his life. The speaker places them in the scene, leaning against the hall door and lighting a cigarette. This image is enough to give the reader a sense of who this person is, or at least what the narrator thinks of him. The narrator also sees his actions as being somewhat careless. The man doesn't seem to consider those around him as he moves, or perhaps doesn't think about whether his action of smoking is even allowed. One night, one might rather come upon the farmhand in this location, and one might find him telling some new joke to a friend. It's clear that this man is social and confident enough to tell untested jokes to his friends, and he's not alone in his life. In the final phrase in this stanza, the farmhand is said to be sometimes looking, to be sometimes found looking out into the secret night. And this statement, especially when considered with the first, paints the man as being rather contemplative. The farmhand, we find, looks out windows, stares into the distance, enough where one might look to find him there. 
and this personality trait seems somewhat at odds with a man who's confidently telling jokes to his friends. Now on stanza two, the speaker continues on to state that even if the man spans, spends a good amount of time staring outside, his eyes always end up back in one place. This is the dance floor, and especially to the girls drifting like flowers. And of course, before the description of the dance or bar is furthered, one is already able to tell that it will be romanticised. The women are not dancing, but they are drifting. They're not women, but they're characterised in the simile as flowers. The world of social and romantic engagement through the farmhand's eyes is unattainably perfect. He's only able to spend a short time considering the beauty that he sees playing itself out on the dance floor. His mind is quickly forced into a pattern of thinking which is much too familiar. The music makes its way to his head and breaks an old wound open. Now in stanza 3, it's at this point that the farmhand's main internal struggle is really revealed in its entirety to us as readers. The entire poem hinges around the reasons why the farmhand believes he's not suited to any other life than the one he has thus far. The man's connection to this music returns him to the real life and he begins to take stock of his own body. He remembers, as the poem states, his sunburned face and hairy hands. He sees these features in contrast to the flower-like appearance of the women he believes he was not made for dancing with. Solely based on the mental image he holds of his own worth and position, it seems that this farmhand believes that love is not really meant for him and he thinks that he's better suited for breaking the earth with a plough and for the crops that seem to grow as slowly as his mind does. Now in stanza 4, this idea is continued as we get a description of all the things the farmhand believes he can't have and how he misses them. He aches over the fact that he has no girl who runs her hair, th her fingers through his hair. He considers that there are no intimate moments with another person that he can cherish, nor are there happy times that he can enjoy. The only things he has to hold on to are his awkward hopes and his envious dreams. They show him what he thinks it can't have, but also comfort him with a reminder that just maybe it may be possible. Now, in the final stanza, stanza 5, the narrator's voice is more apparent. He's speaking directly to the reader and asking that one not judge the farmhand over what he does not have or what he lacks in confidence. Instead, this person should wait until the harvest and watch him as he works. An observer would see him lifting effortlessly and showing off his strength humbly to the world. One would also see his tender side, something he takes advantage of to fix and care for, machinery. These final lines prove that this man, although he doesn't have he does not see it in himself rather, he has all the attributes of a lover. He doesn't need to change who he is to become better or to fit into a mould. Now the next poem in this collection is Malibrity by Sujata Bhatt. Now this poem is an 18 line poem which is contained within one long block of text. So, malibrity is a word that's used in the title but not in the text of the poem, and it can be defined as the qualities of womanhood. This choice of title will make more sense as one understands the purpose behind the speaker's description of the girl she sees on the streets near her home. Now, this poem describes the sight of a young girl in India who spends her days picking up cow dung and the inherent glistening power she has. The poem begins with the speaker describing how she's been unable to forget the sight of one particular girl on the streets nearby where she lives. The girl was often on the streets of the city picking up cow dung to sell for, for a small profit. It's not only the sight of the girl that's halting, but it's the smells that flow around her. The speaker is able to sense the smell of road dust, canna lilies and freshly washed clothes and these smells are in stark contrast to one another and they show the complicated existence that the girl is living. By the end of the piece, the speaker has come to describe the power that she sees in the girl's presence. She has an inherent glistening that imbues her with abilities and a power that others don't have. Now, if we look at lines one to four, the speaker starts this piece by describing a thought that's often passed through her mind. It's of a girl whom the speaker often sees around the area in which she lives. However, there's very minimal description given of this girl. However, one is able to infer that she's quite poor. The following line describes the type of life that this girl was living and how that life overlapped with that of the speaker. 
The first line describes how the speaker has been unable to stop thinking about the, the poem states, girl who gathered cow dung. And this opening phrase is quite shocking and it forces the reader into an immediate questioning of why anyone would do such a thing. While it's not explicitly stated in the poem, it's most likely that the girl was dug gathering the dung so that she might sell it. It was, and still is, used in parts of Indian Pakistan as a source of fuel, as it's rich in concentration of methane, and this therefore makes it a viable source of power in more rural parts of the country. Now in lines 5 to 9, the dung that the girl has picked up goes into a wide round basket, as the poem states, which she carries along with her. She travels down roads that are well known to the narrator, so much so that the speaker can pick out markers that the girl would have passed along the way. She mentions the temple located in this one particular district, Maninangar. And this temple is of the Vaishnava denomination and is devoted to Radhani, who's also known as Radhika or Radha, a popular Hindu goddess. It's important to note how the grandiose the, the name sounds and the purpose of this temple contrasts with a young girl whose only source of money is made by gathering cow dung. There's a real stark contrast here. The poet thus creates a powerful, thought-provoking setting for her narrative. These lines also describe what it is about the girl that so attracted the narrator's attention. She's been continuously thinking about the way this girl moved, and the poem states, moved her hands and her waist. The girl's body and her physical movements have stuck in the speaker's mind, and this could be for a number of different reasons. Perhaps the girl is quite thin due to her economic situation, or perhaps she moves in a very intriguing way. The lines continue to state that the speaker has also been remembering the smell of cow dung, as well as that of, as the poem states, road dust and wet canna lilies. Once more, the poet has created an interesting contrast. This time, though, it's among smells rather than sights on the streets. The beauty of the environment portrayed through the image of the canna lilies is juxtaposed with that of road dust and cow dung. It's clear that the world the speaker is living in is a complicated place. An additional note of interest in regards to canna lilies is that they're often used in India in the production of alcohol, a fact that dampens their purity in this piece. The speaker continues on to describe a number of other smells that she can remember around the girl. There's that of monkey breath as well as freshly washed clothes, and once more the poet has crafted a really interesting contrast to these images. She also describes the smell of the dust from the crow's wings, and this is a different smell, one that's not easily recognised and perhaps more ephemeral than physical. Now in lines 10 to 13, the speaker returns once more to the smell of cow dung. This seems to be a constant in the girl's life. It's something that neither she nor the speaker in her obsessive thoughts can get away from. The smells that are surrounding the girl are important to the speaker's image of her, or at least there were. They've now come to represent something much more meaningful. The smells come to the speaker simultaneously. They're almost overwhelming in the number and presence, and it's for this reason that she's been unwilling so far to use the girl for a metaphor. Now in lines 14 to 18, which is the final section, the speaker comes to the main point of the poem and describes why it is she spent all this time thinking about this one poor girl she saw in the streets. She had been unwilling and still is unwilling to utilise this girl as a metaphor in an effort to create a nice image. The speaker doesn't want to take advantage of the beauty that she sees in this young woman to advance her own words and above all else, the speaker is unwilling to forget her or take the time to explain to anyone why she sees the girl as great. The speaker doesn't see the girl as being great, she knows she is great. She can see in this young person a quality that she can't find anywhere else. Furthermore, there is a power glistening from the presence of the girl that radiates out through her cheekbones every time she passes by, and it doesn't matter what task this girl is working at. In fact, the degrading nature of picking up cow dung only further emphasises, from the narrator's perspective at least, the beauty that's inherent within her. It seems that the girl has all the qualities of womanhood that makes a person strong, and she's doing what she needs to do to survive, just because it's not something that's traditionally thought of as being empowering or feminine, doesn't mean that she can't do it elegantly and powerfully. Now the next poem in this collection is Plenty by Isabel Dixon. 
So this poem focuses on the contrasting feelings of a person who, as a child, experienced growing up in relative poverty, yet who now as an adult is able to put her memories into context, especially with regards to her mother. And also as an adult, she's become far more financially stable. This is also a poem about nostalgia, taking the reader back through the first person speaker's mind to a household in Karoo, South Africa, where the poet grew up with her sisters and mother. As the poem progresses, the domestic scenes from the past increase in details, with the antics of the sisters fraying the nerves of the stoical mother with a clasp-like smile. As the importance of water becomes increasingly clear, that part of the world being subject to extremely dry weather, we find that Isabel Dixon herself had left her own native South Africa to study in the UK for better opportunities. And it's interesting that, of course, this poem might be potentially semi-autobiographical because it could be a nostalgia look back for somebody who now, based in Cambridge and London, looks back at her early years. Thus, we can argue that this poem really explores Isabel Dixon's past, her homeland and her roots, but also her present in the UK. Now, Plenty is a lyrical poem that focuses on the family household of the past, the speaker looking back as she luxuriates in the present, and she seems to be reminiscing about childhood scenes as her mother tried to keep a tight hold onto things. The main theme in this poem is time and how precarious time alters. In particular, there's a change in how the speaker in the poem sees her mother. There's a profound difference between the mother of her childhood and the mother of her present, who's now passed away. The speaker's childhood takes the bulk of the poem, and the final two stanzas are the retrospective part where a new awareness becomes apparent. The once poor but happy child is now an adult who relishes sensual luxury. However, despite this awareness, the speaker feels an emptiness and misses her home and her scattered sisters. Even if the speaker is now materially more rich than she was when she was a child, she still misses this past. There's strong imagery and constant shifts between the personal and the collective. So we have the contrast between I and we, my, mine and our. This draws a reader into the chaotic household of the speaker. The first object of focus in this poem is a bathtub and the fact that it was never full due to a lack of water, which is a sub-recurring theme. From this initial opening image, the reader is then treated to a close-up profile of the mother, in particular her hard-pressed smile. We wonder if it's a forced grimace brought on by the rioting children or if it's a genuine ch- smile. Also make note of the language contrast between the atmosphere and the house and the mother's attempts to keep, keep things stable. There's the words riot, despair, age stained, poked, anger, chaos, as well as anchored down, clasps, snagging locks and straps clamped hard. With varying yet careful, straightforward syntax, in other words, sentence structure, From single sentence stanzas to short, pithy half lines like Mummy Smile. This is interesting use of contrast within language that Dixon employs. Now, the ignorance of the child back then, unaware that her mother had to be firm and harsh to keep the house and the family afloat, contrasts sharply with the adult narrator who can now enjoy plenty and really understands the reason for her mother's strictness. The newfound freedoms come only because the speaker once experienced times that were lean, hard and difficult. We could argue that perhaps Dixon, or the narrator in this poem, is feeling a little bit of guilt with the bubbling up water to her chin in her current place, where once upon a time it felt sinful to be stealing even an extra inch. There's a mix of contrasting musical everyday language. There's lots of imagery and colourful recall and this poem explores the feelings that accrue over time between the past and the present, between ignorance ignorance and knowledge as well as innocence and maturity. In particular, this look back into the personal history and family routines is something really common to all people. Indeed, attempting to put childhood experiences into perspective is tricky. However, this poem seems to achieve its goal with a humorous mischief and a keen observation to the fore. This poem has is a free verse poem of eight stanzas with 32 lines and there's no set rhyme scheme or meter. The beat alters and it produces a far more conversational feel to the poem. 
there's a great deal of assonance as well as enjambement. And this occurs in every stanza specifically on enjambement, but and this speeds up the pace of the poem. The poet also uses hyperbole, metaphor, oxymoron, and simile to really describe particularly the mother. Now, the next poem in the anthology is The Three Fates by Rosemary Dobson. Now, this poem is a five stanza poem, which is separated into sets of three lines or tercets, and each of these stanzas are formatted similarly in that generally the first line is the longest and the third line the shortest. Structurally, this poem acts as a narrative with a clear beginning, middle and slightly ambiguous end. The title of this piece, The Three Fates, is a reference to three goddesses from Greek mythology, Clotho, Lachesis and Atropos. These three are responsible for human destiny and are in charge of making sure that those who are meant to die at a specific time do die. This poem describes the life of a man who's forced to live through the same events in reverse for eternity. The poem begins with the speaker stating that the main character is on the verge of death. He's in the water of a river and is about to drown. The man calls out to the sisters of the three fates, asking them to save him. They do so, but not without forcing him to pay a terrible price. When the man emerges from water, his life resumes, but in reverse. He puts his clothes on backwards, returns to his home, and is forced to watch his true love grow younger and younger. Indeed, his life is falling apart and there's nothing he can do about it. He can't even write poetry from beginning to end and his tears fall before he feels sadness. In the final lines of the piece, it's become clear that this is not a one-time occurrence. The man has been granted eternal life, but only for this one specific period of time. When he reaches the end or the beginning of his life, everything returns to the moment before he fell into the river and it all begins again. Now, when you look at stanza one particularly, From the first line of this piece, the narrative position is clear. The speaker is a semi-omniscient narrator, and they're able to look into the mind of the main character and understand and describe their motivations. Also, do note that this story is not occurring as the speaker describes it, but it's being retold at a later date. The narrative picks up at an extremely dramatic moment in the main character's life, when he's on the verge of drowning. It's not clear at the beginning of the poem how the man got to this point, but he's quite desperate. He's about to lose consciousness when he cries out for, as the poem states, the three sisters. The reader should be prepared for this invocation, having read the title of the poem, The Three Fates. Indeed, as described above, the three sisters and the graces and the fates are a group of goddesses who are responsible for the deaths fated for humanity. Thus, the main character asks the graces at that moment to intervene on his behalf. And while the reader doesn't hear what he said, one can assume it took the form of a prayer which was granted. Now in stanza two, while the narrator and reader know at this point that the more troubles ahead of the man because he got what he asked for, he has been saved from the waters. He bobs up to the surface of the water and makes it back. The next line is the first clue to what exactly has gone wrong. He seems to be moving in reverse and his life has entered a new period in which he must experience all things backwards. Now in stanza three, the third tercet describes how this change in his life has forced him into even worse suffering. The speaker makes sure to note that one particular thing that drove him to passion was the way he was made to write poems from the end backwards. Not only is he physically living in reverse, but his mind seems to be working that way too. He's able to predict, at least emotionally, things that are going to happen next, and he brushes away tears that had not fallen, experiencing the sadness before the actual emotion itself. Now in stanza four, his true loss is described. He's forced to watch the world go in reverse around him. The speaker introduces the fact that this man loves a woman, someone who's incredibly important to him and whom he's forced to watch grow younger and younger. He observes her, swinging in the garden, growing even more younger. He sees her bare feet and the straw hat she wears on her head. The world is still vibrant and very real to him. However, he sees it different from how he used to see it. He's not been relieved of the prior knowledge of how his life was. It's clear that the fates and the effort to punish the man for his brash invocation have given him exactly what he wanted, but with a really terrible twist. 
Now in stanza five, the full breadth of the man's now terrible life is made clear. He not only has to watch his life go backwards, but experience it repeat itself over and over again from the moment before he begins drowning. He's made to see the woman he loves revert to childhood and watch the end of the wind and daylight. And then there's a pause in this part of the poem. In the moment of hesitation, the life he's living is taken back to its new beginning. Again, he's standing on the bank of the river with, as the poem states, the real unrolling. Now the speaker reveals to the reader how the narrator ended up in the river to begin with. He was fishing and was pulled into the water. It's quite fitting that in a narrative defined by its reversal of time, the beginning of the story is only revealed at the end. Now the next poem in this collection is Those Winter Sundays by Robert Hayden. Now this poem is a three stanza work where the sections vary in length, though the theme remains from start to finish. This poem is a narrative of a time when the speaker's father would care for his family in ways that went unappreciated, even though the speaker gives indications that the work done by his father was something worth appreciating. In fact, the speaker notes that he benefited from that work, but there was no gratification shown towards his father. In other words, there was no gratitude towards him. This concept is prevalent in the poem's lines and eventually it becomes clear that the unthankful child has become an adult who criticises his youthful lack of gratitude, though he links the fault with his early inability to understand his father's struggles. In the end, it seems, the relationship faltered because of the division created by misunderstanding and no inclination is given that it was ever repaired. The end result is a poem that is encumbered with guilt. Now, the first stanza dives directly into a general recollection from the speaker's youth, and the narrator begins the account of how hard the father worked to tend to his responsibilities. In the first two lines, the reader can note one clue regarding the father's ongoing work schedule, since the speaker doesn't just say Sundays were a day of work, but also Sundays too. What that detail denotes is that the father worked throughout the week, something that is such a given that the weekday workload doesn't need to be elaborately addressed. On those Sundays, the work began early for his father. Indeed, his workday obviously stretched into the weekend, and he hardly started his efforts in pleasant circumstances. Instead, he had to commence his daily labours in cold, with lingering effects from prior workloads like, as the poem states, cracked hands that ached. It's worth noting as well that the only task that is specifically labelled in this first stanza is he started the fires ablaze, which showcases a care being extended towards the family that he himself didn't experience. The stanza ends with a declaration though that no one ever thanked him. This statement begins an impassioned case against the child who would let such actions go without a word of gratitude, given how much the father worked to ensure the child's comfort and well-being. In stanza two, the reader is introduced to evidence that the father's work ethic was great since the speaker is stating he was not awake when the father started working. Rather, he would, as the poem states, wake and hear the cold splintering breaking. By the time he was awoken by the call, his father would send him, the rooms were warm, already, which shows a level of care from the father. He didn't just start the fire to cater to his child, but also he didn't want to wake his child from sleep until the room had lost its chill. The child, it seemed, felt no rush to join his father in the daily chores since, slowly, he would raise and dress, as the poem states. So again, the reader is met with indications that the father went out of his way to make the existence of his child better than his own. However, in the final line of this stanza, a confusing prospect is brought about into this discussion, in that, while the child seemingly had every reason to appreciate the father, he also had some sort of fear about his living situation. The poem states that he feared the chronic angers of that house. There are a number of possible explanations we can consider, one being that the house itself was falling apart, and the adult who was once the child in this situation reminisces on these issues by labelling them chronic angers. If such is the case, the notion that the child was afraid of what the father dealt with creates another reason why the father was worthy of gratitude. As a child worried over the disrepair of the house, the father continued his duties in spite of the problems. 
It's also possible that these chronic angers are referenced as an indication of tension between the father and child. Already, the concept that the child neglected to show their gratitude has been established. The father, knowing of this disregard, is being is feels hurt and resentful, and this could be conceivable. A worse prospect could be that the child may have neglected to thank him out of resentment for some kind of emotional neglect or physical abuse that the father may have inflicted on him. However, this seems unlikely and this would alter the theme of the poem. Now in stanza three, it seems the idea that the father is abusive really does lose a portion of possibility as the speaker admits that the father had been there for him against the cold and through preparing his good shoes and because the speaker in his older years describes his father's feelings for him as love. He pairs that idea with the term austere, indicating a strict environment and that detail could grant the missing information from the second stanza. The reason for the tension, the chronic angers that were mentioned, could be that the father was strict in his parenting way, in a way that the child may resent. This idea is further cemented since the speaker doesn't seem to hold the same tension towards his father that he had in his youth, and he seems to have applied years of wisdom and growth to the situation to conclude that as a child, he simply had not understood his father's intentions. Overall, the reader can leave this poem feeling the regret of youth wasted and a relationship that never healed from perhaps the speaker's ungratefulness and their lack of gratitude. It seems that the speaker is expressing guilt and grief on what they should have felt could have been a closer relationship with their father. Now the next poem in this collection is Midterm Break by Seamus Haney. Now this poem is a seven stanza poem which is made up of sets of three lines or tercets. These tercets remain consistent throughout the poem until the reader comes to the final line. This line is separate from the preceding stanzas and acts as a point of summary for the entire piece. Midterm break doesn't follow a specific rhyme scheme, but it's still unified through the similar line lengths and the moments of half and full rhymes that exist throughout the text. One other important poetic technique is that the poet utilises that uh, alliteration. This is seen quite clearly in the first stanza in which the poet uses a number of words that start with the C sound, including college, counting, classes, clock, all within three lines. Now, this poem describes the emotional turmoil experienced by a speaker who's lost a loved one in a very traumatic way. The poem begins with the speaker stating that he's been quarantined with a, within a sick bay of his college. It's here he waited for his neighbours to come and pick him up and take him home. The boy has suffered a loss, one which doesn't become clear until the final line of the poem. He travels home and is met by a suffering family. His father is crying and his mother is unable to even speak. Also, the boy arrives via an ambulance the next day and he takes a look at it, or rather, uh, at what he's supposed to be looking at when morning. It seems that there are no great injuries that he can see, but he knows that this is due to the fact that the person was thrown by the bumper of a car. The final line of this poem states that the coffin will only be four feet long, the same length as a child's age, and it's clear to the reader that the speaker has lost his young brother in an accident. Now to go into a bit of detail on of the, um, the poem. In stanza one, the poem begins with the speaker stating that he's been trapped within a sick bay of his college medical centre for the entire morning. One might initially think that this is due to an illness that the speaker has contracted. However, the poet has chosen to emphasise the alienating impact that this loss or whatever it is he's experienced in the sick bay may have on the speaker. Indeed, the speaker seems to be suffering alone. And whilst it's not very clear as yet to us why he's suffering alone, it seems to be incredibly a moment filled with tension. The speaker can hear the bells ringing and they understand within the sick bay that it's two o'clock before anyone comes to get him. We get a sense of the depth of the speaker's loss and this is made clear by the fact that it's not a family member who retrieves him but the neighbours and so we as readers realise that something is terribly wrong. In the second stanza the speaker arrives home and the first thing he sees is his father on the porch crying. This is a shocking sight as in the past when they had attended funerals before the father always took them in his stride. 
He's never even very moved. However, his actions right now of grief are a stark contrast. In stanza three, the speaker is now inside the house with his closer family members. There's a baby in the room, blissfully unaware of the mourning that's going around. The men in the room are associates of his father, and the father who's grieving appears to be caught off guard and embarrassed by his grieving. At this point, we as readers still don't know what the speaker has lost. In stanza four, however, it's made clear that it's not his mother who's died, as she's there holding his hands, as all the strangers speak to him, and endless numbers of strangers line up to speak to him. The young speaker is able to hear them, also telling one another that he's the eldest child who's away at school, when whatever happened, happened. In stanza five, this mother is still holding her son's hand, and she's unable to express herself, and all she can do is cough out angry, tearless sighs. It seems that this mysterious loss is too great to have any meaningful words. An amount of time has passed since the boy learned of this loss and the corpse has now been processed. In stanza six, the speaker is finally able to confront a body. He goes up to the room in which a body is kept the next morning and sees the, the poem states, snowdrops and candles beside the bed. This is a peaceful scene, one of meditation and quiet contemplation. This is the first time we realise that this boy has seen this person in six weeks, and it's unclear how long the body has been there, or how long the accident has been. However, we get the sense that the boy has been away from school for quite some time. In the final stanza, the identity of the person is finally revealed. We realise that the body is, belongs to somebody who is very young and it seems to be highly twisted from an accident because, as the poem states, the bumper knocked him clear. Whoever this person is died from the impact of a car accident. The final line makes clear the person's identity. The body belongs to the speaker's brother, who was only four years old when he was killed and he now rests in a coffin. Now the next poem is Little Boy Crying by Mervyn Morris. This poem is a four stanza poem that's separated into sets of lines which vary in length. The first stanza contains seven lines while the following contains six and the poem concludes with a short line and this phrase attempts to wrap up the entire theme of the piece. Each stanza is dedicated to a particular part of the young child's experience. The first stanza describes his general state of being and his initial reaction to being slapped by his father. The second one turns to the father and depicts him through the eyes of the child. He's an ogre to him in this moment. The final six line stanza is told closer to the father's perspective and describes how he longs to comfort his child, but he must maintain his composure to ensure the lessons he's trying to teach are not lost. This poem seems to describe the emotions of a child who's stuck by his father, who rather is struck by his father for playing in the rain. The poem begins with the boy's emotions and his lack of control over how he acts, how he reacts to things that have happened around him. It seems one moment he's laughing, however the next he's crying as his father slaps him. The reaction from the father is described in the third stanza, However, the second stanza is devoted to a boy's feelings towards his father, who he sees as an ogre, as he feels very resentful. The final six lines of the stanza speak of the father's love for his son, and how that love have driven him to want to teach him important lessons. And this particular lesson involves not playing in the rain. He wants to reach out and comfort his son, but restrains himself in an attempt to teach the son not to be foolish. Now in stanza one, the, narr the, the narrator of the poem is able to look into the mind of the child, who's the main character, and describe the intense emotions that they're feeling. This child is young, only three years old, and is unable to control themselves. The stanza emphasizes transition from laughter to sadness, from fear to anger. The first lines describe the physical appearance of the child as he laughs and how his mouth contorts into all sorts of interesting shapes. The laughter he was just enjoying quickly turns to howls and his recent relaxed body becomes tight. We don't receive any further description of what's happened to the child until the end. But of course we learn that his father had slapped him. 
Now in stanza two, the child is disappointed as he sees the father as an ogre who's standing over him at this moment. This ogre, who of course we later find out is the father, seems in the child's eyes to be beyond love. He's not a member of the family, he's a giant and wants to be aboard. The child looks at the father and feels that he must be empty if he contains anything that's such colossal cruelty. In this moment, the child hates his father. There's no room for any other emotion in his young mind. His mind works creatively, acting off the image of his father as an ogre, and he imagines he can trap him in a pit and cut down a tree he's scrambling down. These imaginations help the child move through his emotions of sadness and anger. Now in stanza three, the speaker turns to the thoughts of his father, but describes them as if from a distance, as there's no true emotion in them. From a new perspective, the reader is able to grasp why it is the father acted this way. The speaker knows a reader will be just as confused as a child is as to why he was slapped. Therefore, he makes it a point to describe what was being done. However, the speaker states that the child's tears have the ability to scold the father, showing that the father didn't just engage in this cruel act for unnecessary reasons. He himself is hurt by having to discipline his own child. Their presence and the emotions which accompany them burn the father as if they are acid. He hates that his child is crying and he wants to pick him up. However, he refrains from doing so in an effort to teach him a lesson that he should learn. Now in stanza four, the final line of the poem, which makes up this short stanza, gives the speaker a glimpse into what it is that angered the father. It's the simple statement, you must not make a plaything of the ring, which lets the reader know that the child was probably playing around outside and lost control, perhaps of splashing in puddles or running from his father. Now the next poem in this collection is Rise and Fire by Norman Nicholson. Now this is a four stanza poem divided into varying sets of lines and the longest standards contain nine lines and the shortest six. One of the most striking aspects of this poem is the way in which the lines are formatted. In an effort to emphasise the repetition of not statements, the poem has indented those lines in and this creates a rhythm from stanza to stanza and draws further attention to the theme, the plot intended. Indeed, this poem describes how one's perspective of life on time changes from birth to childhood, adulthood and old age. The poem begins with the speaker reflecting on the words of his child, or a child in his care. The child claims to be rising five rather than four years old. He's looking into the future towards an increased age as a positive. This is something which scares the speaker and sends him into layers of contemplation about his environment and what it means to live. He looks around him and sees the landscape is gracefully changing. It's no longer winter, but rising spring. He broadens his view further, up into the sky, and sees that the sun is setting. The day no longer exists, as it's the rising night. In the final stanza, he reflects on how one considered the process of ageing, while young, and how that changes with marriage and parenthood. By the end of the poem, he sees living, not as life, but as rising death. Now in stanza one, The speaker presents the reader with few personal details about his life that help draw one into the narrative. The poem begins with a specific, a child that the narrator is raising, and it ends with broad statements on life and death. In the first lines, the poet is relaying the words of a supplementary character in this narrative. The son of the speaker, or at least someone who is taken care of, refers to himself as Rising Five. The child doesn't want to be four any longer, but instead claims to be closer to five. As the poet writes this section, he adds intimate details of the boy's appearance. The speaker describes little coils of hair that bounce on their head and little spectacles that he wears. The child seems full of life and his eyes appear to be enhanced by imagination. This vibrant description is punctuated by the final lines which speak to the tentative nature of life and ageing. In stanza two, the speaker broadens the range of life that he's analysing. He moves his attention from the child to the day which is all around them. These two characters are in a field among cells of life of spring. Everything around them is moving and changing as if in part of a dance. 
This feeling is emphasised through the poet's alliteration of the B and S sounds. The world appears to be in a state of constant change, a fact that the speaker doesn't take any comfort in. It seems the world is changing just as a child is. It too is ageing and the seasons are progressing. While it's technically May, it's so late in the season that it could be referred to as Rising June. In stanza 3, the speaker takes another step back from the moment and looks at the larger passage of time in this place. He's no longer focused on the boy whose words sent him on the tangent, but he casts his gaze instead to the sky. It's here that he sees how the dust is separating in the light. The sun can be bright and fall one moment, and then it can be rising night. The setting of the sun is a clear allusion to death, and the dark subject matter the speaker will tackle in the final stanza. All of these stanzas make clear to a reader that having this child under his care has made the speaker think deeply about what it means to be alive and how limited time is. Ageing might seem like a good thing to a four-year-old, but to the caregiver or parents, it's a very terrifying prospect. In the fourth stanza, the speaker elaborates on what it means for the seasons to change and for the old to be pushed out by the new. The speaker describes this elegantly with the phrase, We drop our youth behind us like a boy who's throwing away candy wrappers. When one is young, it's impossible to value youth and the possibilities inherent in the time ahead. In the state of mind, one is never able to see the flower, they can only see the fruit. Indeed, life is all about instant gratification with no appreciation for the simple beauty of a moment. A flower will be overlooked. On the other hand, as one ages, it's impossible not to see time and the future. When one looks at the marriage bed, one sees a baby cradle. Then when one looks for the bed, they see the grave. Life becomes intertwined with death, so that one is not living so much as rising dead. Now the next poem in this collection is Immense by Adrienne Rich. Now this poem is a four stanza poem which is separated into sets of four lines. While Rich chose not to utilise a rhyme scheme in this piece, she made use of other poetic techniques. For instance, she chose to repeat the short phrase as if a number of times throughout the poem. These two words begin eight of the poem's 24 lines. She also used very little punctuation, and the entire poem is comprised indeed of one long drawn out phrase which runs from the first word to the last word without a full stop. This poem describes the purity of the moonlight as it passes over and soaks into the face of the earth. The speaker begins by describing the purity of the moon's light and how, on certain nights, it's more meaningful than others. The night of this poem's telling as is one such night. The light emerges, on this particular night, from behind an apple tree. This light crosses the ocean. It then pauses for a moment on the sand of the shore, relishing the solidity of the earth, and then it begins to climb. The moonlight moves up a cliff face and then comes into contact with humanity. It's then forced to travel through gash-like quarries and across the vast piles of waste humankind has discarded. This light finally reaches the population of the earth and rests the eyelids of the sleepers, hoping to amend the actions of humanity. The purity of light is wielded as a weapon for the good of the earth. Now in stanza one, the poem begins with the speaker stating that there are certain nights of the year, or perhaps certain nights scattered throughout time, where light has a certain property. It holds an increased amount of meaning in these instances. It's on one of these nights that the speaker begins to make amends. The first and the second line state that the night that the light on a night like this seems to explode out of a cold apple bow. The light emanates from this very specific place and it's likely that Rich chose these bows of an apple tree as the apparent source of light for this, for its literary and religious significance. The tree bore forth knowledge and now it's shining a light upon the world, much like the tree of knowledge and life in the Garden of Eden was one which bore apples. The light isn't appearing from nowhere but it's actually shining from the moon, through the branches of the tree. It just looks as if it's coming from the bark, when in reality it comes from a force far greater. It moves from the tree to the ground and across the landscape, picking its way over small stones. And this is just the start from the moonlight. It has a long journey ahead as it moves across the surface of the earth. Now in stanza 2, this stanza picks up right where the first left off, 
with the first of the lines as it phrases. Due to the fact that this poem is one sentence, the reader won't come to the end of the phrase until the final line. Many of these lines seem to hang in space without a conclusion, and this is done on purpose so that it would seem as though there's no end or beginning. One line just runs into another. The moonlight appears to be moving over the small and greater stones and begins to rise with the surf. Now a reader will understand that the light has started below the horizon in the place that the apple tree resides and has begun to touch the ocean waves. The light has made its way onto the shore and like a human being it lays its cheek on the sand. This light only pauses briefly according to this personification, however it takes a moment to feel the solidity of the earth and the texture of the sand. From here it moves up a cliff face that abuts the coast. The texture of this feature is less pleasing than the small grains of the sand. The cliff is broken and there are ledges the light must overcome and it does so easily and flows up the cliffs to the tracks. This is the first moment of true human presence that the poet has allowed to enter into the story. Indeed, it seems that the poet deliberately made a choice to show the purity of the world without humankind. Now in stanza three, the poet confronts the impact of humankind on the face of the earth. The moonlight has moved away from the purity of the previous watery landscape to a new one that has been cut up and added to by humanity. The light is now pouring, unavailing, into a gash, and it's clear from the word choice that the quarry to which it refers is not natural. It's a blemish or a gash upon the landscape. The quarry is made of and filled with sand and gravel that's been tuned to that purpose. Next, the light moves on to fuselage. This refers to the body of a crop-dusting airplane that has been discarded and stored in a hangar. The location is most likely less most likely less of a hangar and more of a trash dump for ancient pieces of equipment. Now in stanza four, the light reaches its last narrated location. Up until this point, it was more like the light was moving over surfaces rather than penetrating them. However, now the light is soaking into the cracks of trailers. The pure and untouched light of the moon is entering into the dirty, contaminated lives of human beings who are with tremulous with sleep. These people are shaking or shivering in their sleep and they're filled with their own lives and histories. The moonlight pauses on the eyelids of the sleepers and these sleepers are all humankind. All people have played a part in changing the face of the earth and thus they are receiving equal treatment from the light of the moon. In the last line of the poem, all of the as it statements come to a conclusion. The light has been moving across the face of the earth in an attempt to heal as if to make amends. The purity of the moon is hoping, through its sheer beauty and presence, to fix what humanity has done to the planet. The damage refers to structures built, the harm done to the environment, and even the sheer waste that's accumulated through human use. It also refers to the mental and spiritual state of humanity itself. Perhaps the moon will be able to change something that's so far been ingrained into the minds of humankind, the need to dominate, control and consume. This is what needs to be amended, most of all. Now the next poem in this anthology is Sonnet 29 by Edna St. Vincent Millay. So she was an American poet and playwright and she received the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in 1923, the third woman to ever win the award. Her poetry includes many sonnets, including this one. However, later in her career, her poetry turned more political as she focused more on the Allies' efforts during World War II, which was between 1939 rather, and 1945. These poems drew a tremendous amount of criticisms. It's her sonnets, however, for which Millet is bestly known for. Unfortunately, she died at 58 from a heart attack. However, today she's considered to be one of the US's most beloved and popular poets. It should be noted that this poem, which is called Sonnet 29, is also known as Pity Me Not. The speaker of this poem is asking her reader, perhaps even the man with whom she's in love, to stop pitying her. While the tone throughout the poem is quite melancholy, the speaker also seems to be realistic when it comes to love, comparing the cycles of nature to the cycle of romance. The speaker recognises and accepts that her lover no longer loves her, and she says that she has always known that this is the way of love, it's fleeting and fickle. As is quite common in a sonnet, the first line of the poem doubles as a title of the poem. 
This work is typical of a Shakespearean sonnet, with 14 lines, a set rhyme scheme, so an A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G, in three rhymed quatrains, and the last two lines of the poem form a rhyming couplet. Throughout the poem, the speaker compares love to nature, which begins in the first quatrain. The speaker then makes a request to her reader, who may also be her former lover, to not pity her. She also begins an extended metaphor in the poem, comparing the love to the ever-changing aspects of nature. She also asks that she not be pitied because the light of love has also been extinguished, for her as well as for her lover. In the second quatrain of this sonnet, it's evident that Millie is using, or rather utilising, repetition with the phrase, pity me not, just as she begins the first quatrain of her poem. She writes, Pity me not for the waning of the moon, nor the ebbing tide goes out to sea. Again, she asks that she not be pitied because the moon is not as bright or as big as it had been, just like the love she and her lover had experienced is no longer as vivid and as powerful as before. It becomes evident that the speaker is directly talking to her former lover as the poem progresses, and she doesn't want them to pity her because the desire and the love he once felt for her has fled, and therefore she does not wish to be loved any longer. In the third quatrain in this sonnet, her pessimism comes out in full force. The speaker has a very cynical way of looking at love. They claim that they've always known that love is fragile and fleeting, like a delicate flower that's beaten by the wind. It's like the tide on a shore that must return back to the ocean and the wreckage that appears after a strong wind. It will eventually be broken. Now the next poem in this collection is Mary Sog by Dennis Scott. Now Mary Song by Dennis Scott is a 17 line poem that does not follow a particular rhyme scheme. Although a careful reading of this piece one will discover that there are a few sets of lines or couplets that do rhyme. One such example is Find and Mind in the last two lines of the poem. The title of this piece is quite literal. The poem seems to be a song that describes the marriage between two people and all the quirks that come with it. The poet also makes repetitive use of the technique of enjambement, which is when the end of a line runs into the next as there's no punctuation. All of these moments are created intentionally in an effort to control the reader's pace and understanding of the poem. Oftentimes, on John Mont can cause a poem to feel halting or choppy, and this can work in the poet's favour as it tends to carry a reader on to the end. Additionally, the strategic placement of these line breaks references the changing landscape that's mentioned in the poem. Just as the husband is forced to contend with the world his wife is constructing, so too is a reader made to navigate the syntax of Mary Song. This poem describes the relationship between a husband and wife, whose relationship to each other is constantly shifting due to the wife's mental and emotional state. The poem begins with the speaker saying that although the couple have been married for years and years, the husband has yet to fully figure his wife out. She's an enigma to him and he wonders about the changes of her personality. There are moments in their lives which she is charming, calm and clear, but others in which she can compare to a powerful, tempestuous storm. The wife's shifting perspectives are violent enough to change the landscape of their relationship. She can cause rain, wind or sun with a turn of her emotion. And the final lines of the poem, the speaker states that the husband has long since come to term with the facts of this relationship and he knows that he, he cannot change his wife. However, he's chosen to remain alongside her as much as he possibly can in an attempt to understand her. Now looking specifically at the lines, so in lines one to six, the speaker introduces the reader to the two main characters, the husband and wife, whose marriage is going to be described. Throughout the poem, the speaker is semi-omniscient in that he can see into the mind of both the husband and describe the emotions experiencing, as well as his connection with the wife. In the first line, the speaker says a line that describes the entire poem and the portion of the husband and the relationship. The pronoun he, referring to the husband, develops and the poem states... He never learned her quite, referring to the wife. Although the two have been and will be together for a long time, the husband has yet to fully understand his wife, who he sees as an enigma. The two have been together year after year, and during that time, the places they lived emotionally and walked together communally have shifted. Although they were side by side, things were always changing. The speaker blames this change in the nature of the wife's emotions towards her husband. One moment she can be walled in anger, and the next she can be laughing like cool water. 
Now line 7 to 14, the speaker continues to describe the nature of the relationship. While they moved through their lives together and the husband took note of his wife's changing mind and emotions, he made a real effort to remember why and how she changed. What made her feel one way? And what made her change her mind? The speaker refers to this effort as charting. The narrator is essentially comparing the way that the husband attempts to understand his wife to the way that an explorer might map a new destination. Every time the husband thought he had made progress with his wife, he made wilderness again, as the poem states. She has complete control over everything and is capable of crafting any world she wants to. There are roads which disappear, making it so that there's never one true map to really understand her. Now in lines 15 to 17, the speaker states that the husband has long since accepted this enigmatic geography. He knows nothing is ever going to change in their relationship, but he embraces this. In conclusion, the speaker says the husband's solution to solving his wife is to spend more time alongside her and understand the, as the poem states, landscapes of the mind. Now the next poem in this collection is Not Waving But Drowning by Stevie Smith. This is a three stanza poem which follows a rhyme scheme that slightly deviates as the poem progresses. In the first stanza, the, line, the lines rhyme with an A, B, C, B rhyme scheme. In the second stanza, we have a D, E, F, E rhyme scheme. And the third, G, B, H, B. The B line words are all unified by an I, N, G end rhyme. This is not the only way in which they're related though, as the poet has chosen to use the same exact ending words in the same order in these lines. The second line of both stanzas end with moaning and the fourth with drowning. The choice to rhyme every other line in this poem lifts up the dark tone to something that's slightly more light-hearted. The rhymes allow the reader to enjoy reading the poem without being too distressed by the dark subject matter. On the other hand, the contrast between the rhyme scheme and the discussion of death and unintentional neglect only draws attention to the most sombre elements of this piece. This poem describes the emotional situation of the speaker, whose true tribulations go unnoticed by all those around her. The poem begins with the speaker stating that there's a dead man, who's not really dead. He's not dead in that his story has more to offer to the world. His death comes at the hands of apathy and neglect. The speaker shows this to be true as she's struggling out in the ocean waters and no one realises this. She's trying frantically to get somebody's attention, but all the onlookers believe her to be waving rather than drowning. In the second stanza, the speaker critiques the emotionless reactions of the beachgoers and acquaintances she's met in her life by describing the words regarding the dead man. They see him, attempt to recall something about his life, and then declare him dead without further ceremony. They believe that it must have been too cold for him and his heart gave out. The speaker continues to tell her listeners that it has always been too cold for her. She has always been too far out to see to make people understand her, especially when she needs understanding the most. Now, when we look at stanza one specifically, the speaker begins with a line that's meant to to hook a reader in and convince them to continue on through the short stanzas. The poet Smith writes, Nobody heard him, the dead man. This is a phrase when read literally seems obvious. Of course, a reader might think one is unable to hear a dead person. But in the case of this poem, there are other factors at work. The muteness of this person is not really what's at stake. The poet continues on throughout the following stanzas. A reader will be then presented with a critique of the listener and observer. It's the beachgoers and the watchers at scene who end up being at fault. The second line in this stanza works similarly to this first. It's equally as shocking, especially when read after the first. The reader who reads this asks if the person is dead and if not why did the speaker say he was dead it's revealed that the dead man is as the poem states still moaning although he's dead in a location the speaker is yet to reveal he's still making sounds it is his death itself which is speaking the loss of life is something to say on the man's behalf and the onlookers are not listening in the third and fourth lines it becomes clear that while the speaker is not a direct participant in the scene This speaker is in the vicinity and has access to the dead man through the line of the sight or omniscient understanding. The speaker is suffering in a way she feels the dead man, who's perhaps on the beach, did as well. She is in the ocean and is on the verge of drowning. She's attempting to flag people down on the beach, but they neither see nor hear her, 
and they don't interpret it in frantic movements as causing alarm, but instead waving. In these last two lines, the speaker moves into the first person, referring to herself as I. She also addresses you. This could refer to a single person, or more likely, a collective body of people who are unable to see her and understand the distress she's in. The second stanza continues the narrative of the woman in the sea and the man who's already died and washed up on beach. This stanza is told from the perspective of onlookers, but relayed from the speaker's perspective. She's unable to hear their words and relays them back in a way that shows an underlying apathy and distaste for the dead. The people on the beach don't pity the dead man. Indeed, it seems like they use pithy words like poor chap, and they're able to remember a very general fact about him. However, no specificities. Indeed, their words show no understanding or true sadness, and some of them even speak flatly that the man is now, as the poem states, dead. They look no deeper into his life or his death than what their first guesses are. And the speaker who's observing this appears to be criticising them as she believes that there's much more to this person than they are seeing. She can see herself in his place. In stanza three, the speaker's emotion begin to come through. She's reenacting what she believes a dead man must have been thinking as he died and in turn what she is thinking now. The speaker is fretting over the situation that she's in and wishing that somehow she had managed to find a way to make those around her understand what she was going through. She states that not only is the water to this day too cold, but it was always too cold. Her life, her emotions, the reactions from she got from her friends, family and peers, all of it was too cold. Although she's suffering deeply out in the, of the water, the dead man is still moaning on the beach. His death, which represents the death and final climax of neglect, is hovering in the background, ready to take the drowning speaker. The last line of the speaker repeats the phrase which was used to end the first stanza and became the title of the poem. She's not living the life she enjoys any more than she's happily swimming in the ocean. She's not waving, but drowning. The next poem in this anthology is She Dwelt Among the Untrodden Ways by William Wordsworth. This poem was written in 1798 and it's one of Wordsworth's best known works. It examines loneliness and loss, but also unrecognised beauty and dignity. This poem has three quatrains with a simple language and it has a very straightforward ABAB rhyme scheme. Furthermore, this poem can be read as an elegiac poem with graceful descriptions in a mourning tone. Thus, the main theme of this poem is death, a death that's described and grieved for throughout the entire poem. The poem also celebrates a girl by associating her to nature with more straightforward language and emphasising a natural expression. Now in stanza one, we learn the area and we get a description of the area in which Lucy, the she, lived. This rural scenery that's painted for us describes an interesting, idealised, beautiful place. From the first line, the lyrical vo voice refers to a she, and this pronoun is the loved one that will later acquire a name, which is Lucy. Notice how it's described that she dwelt, meaning that she lived there in the past. Although this rural scenery is described as idyllic and magnificent, Lucy was alone and there was no one to praise her or love her. The first line which serves as the title of the poem suggests that Lucy lived both physically and spiritually unrevealed and distant. In stanza two, this stanza focuses on nature. As a re representative romantic device, the lyrical voice compares the beauty of nature to the grace of Lucy. She's likened to, as the poem states, a violet by a mossy stone, half hidden from the eye, and a fair star, when only one is shining in the sky. These comparisons serve to exemplify Lucy as an embodiment of beauty. Notice how the description is made by an economic use of words and they depict Lucy's simplicity by using short, straightforward, everyday words. These words create a meaningful and powerful poem that emphasises the passionate feelings of love and grief. Now stanza three serves as an antithesis. The lyrical voice accentuates Lucy's isolation. It states, she lived unknown and few could know when Lucy ceased to be. This poem follows a cyclical person, a pattern rather. Notice how the stanza repeats the characterization of Lucy as distant and unknown, like in the first stanza. Moreover, this cycle is related to the movement between growth and death, and the cyclical form conveys great dramatic intensity. 
Lucy's death is expressed with great sadness, as the poem states, but she is in her grave and oh. Love is asserted by the lyrical voice's exclamation of difference, and the lyrical voice, dissimilar from others, feels that they are unlike what they were before, because they could never love Lucy passionately, and this is what changed them. This difference functions powerfully through understatement and establishes a dramatic ending for the poem. Notice how the lyrical voice focuses on their experience and how Lucy affected them, rather than on the beloved one. So that's all. If you enjoyed this video, do subscribe to our channel and give this video a thumbs up. But also do visit our website, which is www.firstratetutors.com. There, you're going to find useful revision guides, model answers written at an A grade, and exam papers that you can use to practice. Thank you so much for listening.